your Bibles to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Appreciate you all being here this morning. Um, appreciate Joan and Jason for learning that song. I love, um, I love that song as mercy is more. Um, in singing, we sing, we we sing good theology, just like you expect a preacher to preach sound doctrine. Our singing must be sound doctrine, and so I appreciate that about this place. We don't just sing whatever; um, we sing about Him, and so I, I appreciate uh, Joan and uh, Jason for learning some songs or bringing in some different ones and new ones. Because they like old songs or new songs, I say yes. That's the answer. Um, there are songs that are old that are so rich and so deep, and there are some new songs that are the same way. So we're kind of weeding through and learning some more things like that, so I appreciate their willingness to do that. The only time I ever fell asleep in church was the Sunday after my senior prom. I, was, I went down, like that kid where Paul was preaching in the Bible, and a guy goes to sleep, and he falls out the window. It's a wild story. Paul has to like, hey, you're, I don't know what he's dead. Oh. And so it's, it's, you should read your Bible. It's a good book. But um, I fell asleep. We had went, A bunch of friends of us went together, which was a great way to go. But um, I fell asleep that morning, and I blame my friends for not keeping me awake. So I'm telling those of you who have been here, who are here this morning, you went to prom, just don't snore. You know what I mean? And, and it won't bother anyone. And if you need to lean on someone, just lean. And uh, when you're not strong and they'll be a friend, that's a song. But uh, just lean on them. I'm glad you're here. I know it's probably a, a lot going on this weekend, but uh, I'm glad you're here. And I, eventually they woke me up, but I don't know what that sermon was about he preached that morning. So you may not know this, but you may not know this one, but you might want to go back on YouTube and see it later. I don't know. But, um, but I, Pastor Ryan's got grace for those of you who, who were at prom last night. So amen. Acts chapter number 19. It's a... Uh, be talking about idolatry today, and uh, that's always a fun subject, so you be in prayer as we, as we preach this. Acts 19, verse number 21. Actually, good on to verse number 23. And the same time there arose no small stir about the way, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain into the craftsmen, whom he called together with, the work, with workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. Call this identifying idols. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for, for Jesus. Help us to fix our eyes on him today. This world has a lot to look at. It also has a lot we could bow down to. I pray, Father, you would help us to stay at the cross. Help us to keep our feet planted solidly on that ground. Thank you for Jesus again. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. I pray as your word goes out that you'll get glory, that I'll be invisible. Your word might be shined through. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. A lot of the points that I make today was, has come from all kinds of places in biblical counseling, especially recently. I've been doing a lot of reading on idolatry and, uh, and its effects on, on our world today. And when we think of idolatry, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Ryan, we don't have statues and we don't have false gods like they did back in the day. But here's what I want you to realize and what I want us to know going into this, that sin at its core is idolatry. Sin attempts to de-god God. Sin says, I want more than God has. Our sin consists of the fact that we've chosen a bunch of things to love and worship more than God. So the root of all sin is basically idolatry. You can bring up any sin and we can run it back to that person has an idol in their life. This gets kind of, it gets a little, little, little tricky sometimes when we're talking about it, even in our American culture. There are many things we would look at that could easily be a good thing that would become a God thing. A good thing that will become a God thing is, well, a family. A family. Yeah, a family. You always dreamed one day you would have a family. And that family, of course, would be perfect. Everything would be perfect. Everyone would be together. It would be 
Well, you could almost sell the frame at Walmart with your picture in it. Everything would be perfect. Your idea, your vision, your dream. Well, your expectations would be my family will get married, we'll have kids, those kids will be perfect, even more perfect than we are. We'll have a house, we'll have a job, we'll have family, we'll have friends, everything will be great, and we will have a family. What happens is, over time, if you're not careful, a good thing, a family, can become a God thing where I have to have this. And if I don't have this, what am I if I don't have this? If you take this away, what would I be? And that can sneak in an idol to say, my idol is actually the perfect family. And you've been around your family long enough to know that don't exist. Amen? I'm not talking about just your family, it's all about mine. You should meet those crazies. So when you think of your family, I have to have a family. I have to have a family. Another thing would be I have to have money. If I have money, then I will have happiness, I'll have success, I'll have if I just have money. If I have money, that means I'll have, wait, I got $5 in here. Hey, that used to buy a hot and ready. It doesn't anymore. And by the way, it frustrates me when hot and readies are not ready. Anyway, I, I went to the Little Caesars the other day. I'm just confessing my idolatry to you. I think hot and ready should be ready, and I, I'm planning a lawsuit, so be afraid of Little Caesars. But so, so I think about money. If I have money, but, but if I have money, and then I, money becomes my idol where I have to have this, and if I don't have this, then who am I? So some would say, I have to have the perfect family. If I don't have the perfect family, then something is lacking, something is missing in my life, is, is, not, is not a good life, it's a failure. And if I don't have money, if I don't have money, if I don't have stuff, if I don't have things, then who am I and what am I? And of course, in the American culture, well, idolatry, it could be. Now I'll be careful, because here's what I want you to know going into this. Many preachers would be stand up in pulpits and say, bless God, these ball games, you shouldn't be going to these ball games. Listen, go to your kids' ball games. Go to them. As a matter of fact, when my kids were little, especially when Isaac was little, I became a coach to keep him from having a crazy coach. I became the crazy coach <laughs> in the process. So my goal was to, to actually keep him from having a crazy coach. I became a crazy coach. But what we have in a lot of these situations is you've got to keep up with a 162-game schedule now. Now kids don't have play ball. Now they have jobs. They're full-time jobs. When I was a kid, we played on Saturdays, and that was it. Now you are running all over creation. And all I'm saying to you as the pastor is just balance it. Balance it. So when we think of sports and things like that, and going to that, Emma's a cheerleader, and that's a nine- or ten-month commitment. That'll be starting again. It just stopped starting again. When Isaac was a kid, he would sign up for ba I remember signing up for baseball one day at a basketball game. That's wild when you think about that. There was no break at all. And so I'm a big believer in sports. I love sports. I think kids who play them just turn out better. I think it's good to be on a team. But you also have to remember the church is a team. And the church needs you as well. And people will say sometimes, well, they're only young once, Ryan. They need to play these sports all they can. Yes, they are. And they're only king's kids once. And they're only youth ministry, youth group kids once. So balance the, because here's what you know, and this is so big in our culture today. This good thing can become a God thing. If you're not careful, you'll start living your dreams through your little one. And, I, and I, I, was, I was coaching one day, I was coaching Isaac, and one of my friends who went to school with, who did not play basketball, he had a son, and his son played basketball, and I t his son was way better than he was back in the day. I remember that. But he was kind of living through to where the boy wasn't even enjoying what he was doing. A good thing is sports, but it can become a God thing, where now we're just kind of taxi services for... And listen, hear my heart on this. Go to those games. Cheer on your kids. Be there on the sidelines. They should look up and see you in the bleachers. But listen, balance it. Amen? Keep it balanced. Make sure you do that. Because it's hard to do. Because the culture will keep pulling you away, pulling you away, pulling you away, and actually wearing you out with this thing. The other thing is these little meme machines. In our culture today, the little meme machine, we actually have these meme machines, and we have, we have, we have websites dedicated to our opinion about everything. I was just trying to get out of Lowe's yesterday with my mulch. I went and got some mulch yesterday. I was trying to get out. A lady, a the cashier told me to come around and go to this lane, so I went around to this lane, and so I had to go back around and go through between two aisles, and there was five people there, and no one, I mean no one, there was like a six, guy in his 60s, a woman in her 40s, there was a teenager, there was, some, there was a little kid. No one was looking up. I mean no one was looking up. All of them were like this, 
entire time. To the point to where the lady beside the guy in front of me, she said, look up. And so he looks, oh, you're trying to get through. Yes. Do you know how you could really get ahead in life, especially if you're a young person? Just look up. You could really gain a lot of ground by looking up. I challenge you to look over from time to time at how frightening it is to be driving down the road. No one is looking up. No one's looking up. And so if you're looking, as you're going to go to, 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 to life, you're going to say, look, and this can become a thing where if you're spending eight or nine hours a day looking at this, that has become a God thing. You say, Ryan, I'm not, that's not an idol to me. Okay, challenge. Give it up for the day. Put it down for the day. Hang out with your family. Hang out with your kids. Hang out with your mom and dad. Hang out with your grandparents. Put it down for a day. If you can't, it might be an idol. Say, oh, how many of these are you going to do, Ryan? You, you? Well, that's pretty much it. But a family can become a God thing. Sports can become a God thing. Money can become a God thing. An idol, it is, I have to have... What do I have to have? Well, in Acts chapter number 19, we know the story as we went through last week. Ephesus, some little Ephesus info from my note takers at this time, the richest city in the, re in the richest region. Primary port, all the region's trade came through Ephesus. It had, when we look at this, you'll see that it had the world's largest temple. The world's largest temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was one of the seven wonders. The statue of Arnimaeus and Diana. Now, she was the protector of their city. It also, for my bookworms, had the world's largest library in the world. I guess libraries are still a thing, but it had the world's largest library. So if you had a library card there at Ephesus, it was a big deal. And so we know what happened last week. Paul was going through. Um, he was having, hang he was having uh, handkerchiefs, and handkerchiefs were healing people through the hands of Paul. God was healing people through the hands of Paul, uh, rather. And so these... Uh, Seven, these sons of Sceva, they were like the ghostbusters of that day. And they're like, hey, Paul is using Jesus' name. I think we should use Jesus' name. And they told demons, we adjure you by the name of Jesus. Come out. And the demon's like, not so fast. We don't even know who you are. Which I talked about demon trash talk last week. And it was, I love it because he says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And so going through to there, we know that the demons actually jumped on them. Then it got really weird, and they started burning all their books and all the idols that they had. They were burning all those books. Well, what happened was, because a spiritual person tried to help people without knowing God, you're in serious trouble when you try to use the name of Jesus, and you don't even know who Jesus is yourself. And so with this picture in mind, all of a sudden, remember, there's this, this statue and there's this false god. Her name's Artemis slash Diana. And she's the protector of the city and she's big business for the city. Demetrius, the guy I just read about, is a businessman. And he has a chain of shops where they sold little statues of Diana and little what would Diana do bracelets. I don't know. People are turning to God and this is affecting business is what we find. So when we look at this, you'll see that what Demetrius says in verse number 24, a certain man, silversmith, which made living, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain to the craftsmen. He calls together the workmen of like occupation, so he calls together all the Diana dealers. I just thought of that. Just Diana dealers, and they're pushing Diana statues. And so people are actually, this is filling their wallets up because Diana is big business, right? So Diana's big business, and in addition to making statues, tourism to the temple was huge. I'm thinking you got hotels, you got restaurants, you got bumper stickers, you got Diana's My Co-Pilot stickers, and all kinds of things going on. You got Diana stickers for camels and all the things on the back. Everything is good. This is big business that they have going on. So this big business, it's affecting now the business, dar uh, Demetrius takes all these people together and says, hey, this is affecting our bottom line. What should we do? Now watch what he says. Verse number 26, you hear, here's what he says, that alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all of Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying they be no gods which are made with hands. This is actually, it's kind of comical because he says, Paul's creating quite a stir because he's saying a god you make with your hands could not have created you. Right? Now remember, Diane's the protector of their city. Diane is a protector of their city. A God you make in your mind and shape with your hands could not have created you. So Paul's point is, you're actually worshiping something you made. 
and now it's become your God, and now we're selling statues and filling our wallets up to a false god. And Paul's point is, and it's the same thing that I hear often, and here's what I hear often from people, my God would never do that. My God would never do that. In that case, your God is just a projection of yourself. Your God is just a superhuman you. When we say things like, my God would never, my God would never, I concoct a God in my mind that's not really worthy of worship. As a matter of fact, he's actually the one that's supposed to worship me. The real God should be able to challenge you and offend you and make you mad and expand you. Otherwise, your God is just a bigger, nicer, cleaner version of yourself. And Demetrius whips everybody up into a frenzy and a flash, which is one of the biggest in the ancient world, this amphitheater. And throughout this chapter, what's happening is, for a couple of hours, they fill the stadium up and they shout things. It looks like a Duke basketball game where they're shouting Diana and Artemis, and all these people are coming together saying basically, long live Diana, Artemis. And the interesting thing is, is they're trying to protect Diana. And if your God needs to be protected, that's not a good God. If you're not careful, you'll think Jesus needs the same protection. But Jesus does not need to be protected. So when we look at this, we would see that there finally the crowd disperses and Paul lives to fight another day because it says not only the craft, verse 27, only this craft is a danger to be set at naught, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed. And that's the thing about our God. His magnificence can't be destroyed from all of Asia and the world. So Demetrius is panicking, saying, Diana's going down here. We've got to help her. We've got to prop up our God. We've got to prop up our God. Because if we prop up our God, then she'll be safe. And so Paul enters verse number 30. And when Paul entered into the people, and so the disciples suffered him not. So the, Paul's like, I'm going to go take them all on. And the disciples are like, probably a bad idea, Paul. And so when we look at this, we would see that Paul wants to go to speak, but his friends wisely say there's no sense going in there because you're probably going to get killed. Finally, the crowd disperses, and Paul's friends, as I said, live to fight another day. And in this, with this backdrop in mind, I want to show you about five things about idols that might surprise you about how these slip into our lives, five ways to identify it. Number one, idols are anything that promises a life of security and joy apart from God. Anything that promises a life of security and joy apart from God. If that is present in my life, I will be happy. If that. If I have that family, I will have joy. If I only have, if my kid gets into college, then we will be, be what? If I could just make another, then I will be. Idols are anything that promises security and joy apart from God. That's what Arnimaeus did. That's what Diana did. She was protector and protector and prosperer of the city. Prosperer of the city. It, they, she guaranteed them security and joy. What is that in your life? And what do you think, if that is present in my life, I'll have joy. Whether it be looks, whether it be success, whether it be influence, whether it be fame, whether it be respect, having children. If I have this, I will have... Now, idols are not usually bad things. They don't start off that way, as I said. But good things that become God things. And the message is, if I am able to be married, then good life will... What if you're not? What if the picture is just you? What if your kid, what if this fastball just ain't fast? What if you work the same job for the same pay and no one ever says, thank you? These are things we have to wrestle with because if you think about it, you could have probably, we could turn, we probably could have turned it into an idol if you lose a good thing from your life. So the picture is what if? What if you stay single? What if you never have kids? What if your health never improves? What if your career doesn't take off? These are questions that we have to ask ourselves and we have to ask ourselves in the deep parts of our heart and we do from time to time to say, what if the picture isn't what I thought it would be? 
What if it's not what I thought it would be? What if my finances are never what I thought they should be? What if my kids are just one of those kids? People say, oh, my kids are. I had a lady tell me that. I trust my kids. I said, I don't trust you if you trust your kids. I don't trust my little crazies for nothing, especially that girl. I don't trust them at all. So you think of it, you just can't. And people, kids say, I, you don't trust me. No, they don't. And they're not told to. They're told to train you. It's to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. So there is a lack of trust, but trust is built over time. And little by little, you're able to build that trust. But trust is built in drops and spilled out in buckets. Once you pour the bucket of trust out, now you've got to drop, 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 drop. But what if you never get any of the things you think you have to have to consider yourself successful? Here's the ultimate question. Will Jesus be enough? What if all God ever gives you is his son? Is that enough? What if all you ever get while you're here is Jesus? What if you never get the perfect picture of the family? What if you never get the perfect income? What if you never, what if you never, Ryan, what are you doing here? I'm trying to show us that these idols can become this, these things of idols. It's very important to understand that they can become something and really, really subtle can become something very big in our hearts. Will Jesus be enough? Secondly, idols engage our hearts. Their idol was the protector of the city. What's the thing in the, that the idea of losing it brings you to despair? If I don't have this, then my life is in despair. My life is in despair. What is it in your life that you would say idols? Is, it, basically, Diana had become their lifeblood, protector of the city, protector of myself, protector. It's going to keep me safe. If you lose this good thing, you're sad. If you lose a God thing, you'll be devastated. So we look at the connected to idols. Deepest emotions are connected to idols. Idols are our deepest emotions. That's why you have to be careful. Even in talking to people about idols, whether it be worry or whether it be anxiety or depression or fear, all the things that we struggle with the most, you can start, in biblical counseling even, you start to poke idols sometimes. And when people start poking at things that you really idolize, it's like, hey, back up. Back up a little bit. I was speaking with a lady a long time ago, and. She was, she'd been done wrong, really wrong. And she was talking about she was very resentful, I mean very resentful. And it didn't take long to listen to her to realize that her resentfulness, that resent was actually what she was resenting, actually had become her idol. She was packing it around. And you couldn't tell her anything about it. As a matter of fact, she was getting upset at me for saying, what are the chances that you just got so used to this you want to stay with this? And she said, I have a re she said, I have a reason to be angry. And I said, you absolutely do. I just don't know if you have a right to stay that way. That's a tough thing to say to someone who's been hurt. Only God has a right to stay angry. We have reasons to stay angry. Well, well you don't know what they did. I know there's reasons to be. But do you know there are people you'll sit across from from time to time you'll realize that whether it be what their struggle is, that's become their God, and no one can talk them out of not having that anymore. It's become their idol. Worry can become an idol. I, I, I'm just to the point to where you start claiming it as your own. My anxiety, it's, it's yours now. now. Now you own it. Now it's, now it's something you carry around. But listen, you can be anxious without me being, having anxiety. You could, you, now, of course, anxiety is a real thing, and we work with, with kids all through the week. I talk to kids all week long through this, and it's obviously a very real thing. But watch yourself when it comes to, well, I've always had this, I'll always be this, but what if you didn't have to have that? Ironically, idolizing something ultimately keeps you from actually being able to enjoy it because idols engage our hearts in ways. Life preservers you cling to. No one enjoys a life preserver, right? It saves you. If you depend on your family, if you depend on your family so much, you'll become terrible at this family thing because it's your lifeblood. You've got to have that. And if it goes wrong, if it doesn't look right, if it doesn't look like Facebook or social media, then it doesn't look like the pictures you see. Take it again. And it's like, you know what, our family pictures are just a mess because our family's a mess, amen? So it's not going to look like, it's not going to look like what you see. But you ever notice that people who seem to have a lot of something seem not to be able to enjoy it? 
some of the most miserable people are people who have a lot of something, a lot of money, a lot of fame, a lot of fortune. They don't even seem happy. It doesn't even seem happy. People are dissatisfied with the thing that becomes their idol because they bowed to it so many times. So idols engage the deepest emotions of our hearts. What's the thing that the idea of losing it would bring you to despair? Third or fourth, I don't know. Idols need to be protected. You've got to protect them, man. Demetrius tries to protect Diana. And as I said, if your God needs your protection, you're in trouble. Idols need to be protected. We need to protect Artemis, is what, is what Demetrius is saying. Irony, she's supposed to be the one protecting them. You know, if you, if, with kids, you bec- if kids, you become clingy with kids. As a parent, we try very hard to protect our kids, but some parents, and you know this, are always controlling their kids' environment, what they eat, where they're at, who's around them. And the point of this is, if you're not careful, that family, those kids, can become idols. And we've got to guard against that. I know what people mean when they say, my kids are my world. I get it, but be careful. Because if not, you'll put standards on them that even you can't raise it meet. So they've got to be that. If they're not this, what are they? Well, they're your kids, right? If, they're, if they don't go into this, this route, they don't follow this way. If money's your God, you're always worried about whether you're going to have enough or not. How can you protect it? How can you keep it? Keep as much of it as you can and save as much as you can. If your reputation is your God, you have to always protect your reputation. Make sure you get the credit. No one can ever criticize you. And if anybody ever says one thing about you, if reputation is your God, you're going to have to go off social media. You ain't going to make it. You're just not. And so if whatever this is, with this idea, it's, they have to be protected. I have to protect my kids, and I do everything. I'm a helicopter parent. I stay over them. I'm not saying you don't, shouldn't watch them. I'm not saying you shouldn't be, always be there for them. But I'm saying we can get so caught up in this is what brings me joy and comfort and safety. And if anything ever happens, God will still be God. And Jesus will still be enough. Jesus will still be enough. So when we look at this, we would say idols need to be protected. If you're not careful, you'll begin to protect them and go to bat for them, and you will find yourself trying to protect something that should be protecting you. And last, I think it's lastly, almost lastly, idols demand sacrifices. The whole system in Ephesus was built on appeasing Diana. So the whole system. So this whole system was we've got to make sacrifices to keep them happy. So if my God, if my idol is money, I'm going to sacrifice for it. I'll walk away from family and friends and all the things. I'll, I'll, I'll gladly do this because my idol is, if I don't have money, I'm not successful. Idols will call on us to make sacrifices. Idols will call on us to make sacrifices. And we do it very easily and very quickly. Idols will call on us to make sacrifices. And this whole system was, let's just sacrifice to Diana, even to the point to where they were actually sacrificing. In Old Testament times, we would see they were sacrificing their kids to this to false gods. And that requires another sacrifice. More people to worship the God of personal comfort. Idols are, we see this, when the first time Satan preaches the same lie to every idol that he preached to our first parents, Adam and Eve. If you obtain this, remember in Genesis... He said, oh, if you eat of that, you'll be like God. That's why he doesn't want you to eat it. It's the, same, it's the same thing he does with us. It's the same trick. If you obtain this, you'll be like God. You have secured infinite power and infinite joy. You'll never die is what he's saying. That's what idols do to our hearts. If I just have this, I'll be, I'll be successful. And here's the good news of idols. There's three ways the gospel confronts idols. And all of us, I don't know if you do, but all of us fight this thing. I, I'm, I'm an idolater at heart, and I say that without, look at me, I'm, a, I'm saying there's even in ministry, ministry to me had actually become an idol in my life. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm in a destination that I can't get to. I remember sitting in a coffee with Rick Steves in Minnesota one day, I, and I remember asking myself the question, what am I if I'm not a preacher? What in the world am I if I'm not this? And it took me about 12 months to learn, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. 
And a lot of what I do, I don't do because I'm a preacher. I do because I'm a Christian, right? So I thought, well, what am I? And so when that's taken away, what are you when that's taken away? And that's the point we would see that what if the church doesn't grow? I'm a pastor now. Pressure. Every, mo- every Sunday, every Saturday, every Saturday night, all through the week studying, getting this ready. Got to bring it. You might be bringing your Aunt Tilly in who doesn't know Jesus. You might be bringing your cousin Fred in who can't stand church, but he said he'd come listen to you, right? There might be pressure. You know how much pressure there is to stand in front of middle school boys making noises that just you don't want to hear anymore while you're telling, I'm preaching deep theologic, I'm offering up theological steak from Hebrews 12, and they're like, can we go outside? When we went outside, I'm like, listen, fix your eyes on Jesus, boys. That's the point of the verse. And they're like fixing their eyes on the basketball court. This isn't working. But it can easily become, what if that doesn't grow? What if the church stays the size? What if I'm here, God willing, for 24 more years? And we're here, we're still here. Now, some of, some people will be 135 years old in that time, but I'll be older too. What if it doesn't grow? What if this class you teach doesn't grow? Who are you? Can, you, can, you can pinpoint these things and say, why am I doing this? If it's not for Jesus, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Idols demand sacrifices. There's three ways the gospel confronts their idols, and I'll be done. And then we get to the point we can see. The true God gives life. Notice that. He is more faithful, his promise is more secure, his presence more comforting, his attention more sufficient, and he means for nothing. Nail that down in your heart. There is nothing that will fulfill you more than he will. There is nothing that I can gain that will be more than him. There is no amount of money that is worth him. He's the fairest of 10,000, the Bible says. He is more faithful. His love is more faithful. Promises are more secure. Presence more comforting. Attention more fulfilling. There is nothing that stacks up, nothing that compares to him. That's the true God gives life. Secondly, God doesn't need to be protected. He protects you. God is a protector. David says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength, my rock, my refuge, my fortress. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? So I don't need to obsess over money or success or fame. Isaiah 26, 2, I will rest in you, and I won't worry about those things. I will rest in you. You are plenty, is what Isaiah is saying. And then lastly, here's the cool part. God offered his own sacrifice. God didn't call on self to sacrifice that day. God offered his son, Jesus, sins all over those words. Because the only God who knew your sin then will satisfy you and when you tell him, he'll forgive you. Diana wouldn't do that. Sports won't do that. Try try just not going to a few practices in a row. See if the coach is like Christ. You say, a little lesson for the kids. You own If you own your house, don't pay the property taxes. It's yours, right? They'll forgive you. Not at all. Here's another challenge for you. Go off of social media for a week. Try this. I did this one year on my birthday. I went off social media on my birthday. I got three text messages. Three. And a couple of phone calls. Right? Now, if I'm on social media... I'm getting 800 HCDs a week. They won't say happy birthday if it's shorter, but they say happy birthday, right? Go off of it. See how forgiving this is. Put your worst mistake on here. See if you lose any points. Do it. As a matter of fact, they'll build an army against you, won't they? If you come to Christ, family can change. Sports are going to change. Money is going to fluctuate. But Jesus Christ is the one stable thing in the universe. You can bow your life down to him and say, here's my life. That is Christ. And he has offered you life. Amen? Heads bowed, eyes closed.
it's a delicate topic and it's a subject matter, of course, but I know in my own heart, maybe this isn't for you, but I know it's for me. I have to be reminded that I can make good things God bad. And we got to guard ourselves against that. This world isn't so forgiving, but Jesus is. If you need prayer, you ever need prayer, you ever need to talk about anything, certainly you can come to us and we can pray about that. But if you need anything, like you have something in your heart right now, you're growing in the Christian, struggling with something, there's something you need to pray about, just up, up with your hand and say, pray for me while I need your prayers. I'll be doing that throughout the week. Thank you in your hands. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. The ultimate question is, will Jesus be enough for all of our lives? Father, we thank you. Pray you'd forgive me, Lord, for I don't know. I don't know the parts of these hearts that I talk to every week, but Lord, I I have a little insight into this one, and I know it's deceitful above all things and can be desperately wicked, as Jeremiah said. So, Father, I pray that you will point out those things even in my own heart. There's so much lust in these, and we know how it comes about so well. Pray, Lord, you would guard me. Pray, Lord, you'd protect me. expensive thing of a plan that sometimes can be human invention. Lord, help us to look up and look around. We're not seeing like there's an enemy in sight. Help us, Lord, our our phones can bring a bright light and it can be colorful. And Lord, our real life can be gray. I pray that would reverse. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to take the time to look around to see the need in people's lives and hearts. Forgive us, Lord, for getting caught up in God when we should all be at work right now. Use us, I pray, in this place. Bless this day. Help us to see souls saved right now and for your glory.